Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Liz Wheeler Show. Speaker Kevin McCarthy gave 41,000 hours of footage from around the Capitol from January 6th to Tucker Carlson. Originally, it was reported that it was 14,000 hours of footage that then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi refused to make public. But 41,000 hours is a whole heck of a lot more than 14,000 hours. So what I want to talk about tonight is what we can expect to see on these tapes. These are video cameras that show almost every aspect of the Capitol from almost every angle, except a couple. There are a couple blank spots on these cameras, even to this day, even with this 41,000 hours of footage, there are some spots that simply aren't surveilled, which you might be thinking that seems really odd. Well, yes, I concur. That seems really odd. So what we can expect to see on these tapes, we will be vindicated. The defendants who are charged with everything from vandalism to trespassing to um, to conspiracy to seditious conspiracy, which is essentially treason, um, to obstruction of an official proceeding. These defendants will be exonerated. Police on these videos will be incriminated. Democrats and their mainstream media lackeys will be humiliated as the farce that they are for propagating the lies that they have told and continue to tell. There are some people out there, even conservatives, who are complaining that Speaker McCarthy gave this footage to Tucker Carlson at Fox News instead of just releasing it at large and letting independent journalists go after it and do the reporting themselves. And I get that. I understand that. It's, it's a lot of fun as independent journalists to have access to something that you can pick through and, and, and present to the public. I, I understand that. However, here's what I expect to see. I expect Tucker T Carlson to do specials on this for this to be an ongoing rollout of, of these videos. But I also expect a Twitter files style rollout after the initial announcement. I expect that journalists who, independent journalists, conservative journalists who you know and who you trust, rep reputable journalists who have proven their integrity, I expect that they will be given access to this footage and that we will see reports from these journalists in addition to Tucker Carlson. That is what I expect to see. Um, one of the journalists, one of the only journalists in our country who has doggedly reported on the facts, the reality of what happened on January 6th, and I'm talking courageously reported, seemingly tirelessly combed through court cases and filings and open source videos and body cam footage, Julie Kelly will join me tonight or today on the show to talk about what we can expect to see on these videotapes from around the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. Let's get to it. Let me tell you about stamps.com. Postage rates just increased again. Luckily, stamps.com has the best discounts in the industry with rates you literally cannot find anywhere else. I'm talking like 88% off UPS and USPS. Um, Get access to the shipping service that you need for your business to right from your computer, anytime, day or night. I'm talking no lines, no waiting, no driving, no bureaucracy. All you need is a computer and a printer. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels right from your home or from your office. It's ready to go in minutes. It's so easy. They even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. I got a great deal for you. You can sign up with promo code Liz for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale, a free digital scale, no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com. There's a microphone at the top of the page. Click that and enter code Liz, L-I-Z. Go to stamps.com, click that microphone at the top of the page and enter code Liz. You'll be glad you did. All right, with me now is the senior is a senior contributor to American Greatness, uh, Julie Kelly. Julie, good to see you. You too, Liz. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so these tapes from the Capitol that McCarthy, that Kevin McCarthy gave to Tucker Carlson, whose team is analyzing them right now. We expect to see the footage compiled into programming here in the next couple of weeks. Um, first of all, I think a lot of us are expecting to see vindication of our theories or our, our analysis that the feds were somewhat behind coordinating and encouraging what happened on January 6th. So my question to you first is what on these tapes would you expect to 
provide that evidence of vindication, that proof that the, that the feds were involved. Well, what I do think we'll see is, Liz, what we're seeing come out of the body-worn camera footage being released. This is uh, footage that's captured by D.C. Metro Police body-worn camera. And that is these undercover agents, uh, informants who have been identified in the crowd. Uh, We just saw armed undercover agents in one body-worn camera uh, footage reel armed agents in full undercover garb walking from the ellipse to the Capitol. What did they do? Will we be able to identify whether they were promoting or provoking or engaged in, involved in some of the violent behavior that day? So I do think we're going to see a lot of those revelations that are unfolding, not only in the body worn camera footage, but also in evidence submitted by defense attorneys in these ongoing trials in D.C., So yes, I think we will see evidence, more evidence of that. I think the American people, Liz, will be shocked at what they see uh, police misconduct, uh, uh, both inside and outside the Capitol building. I mean, egregious instances of police brutality against American citizens, including women. I think the American people will be shocked to see that. Uh, I think we'll also see, Liz, the deployment of photographers and videographers who are planted and stationed inside the building before the breach occurred. Why were there so many filmmakers and uh, videographers and photographers, including Nancy Pelosi's daughter, uh, inside the building recording what happened? So I think that Tuck, what I believe Tucker will lay the groundwork for are some of the biggest bombshell revelations. And then you could have other journalists, other independent uh, posters on social media who will do some more of the drilling down into the details. Yeah, my hope would be that this ends up like a Twitter file situation where independent journalists are able to comb through the footage and release what they have found the way that the way that so many of that handful of journalists that Elon Musk picked to go through all of all of the stuff on the back end of Twitter here. So I, I I think I think it's going to be vindication. I think that that's pretty obvious. We have all the pieces. We just need the last variables here. But what do you think will be different in the footage from the Capitol compared to the footage that was used or cherry picked even by the January 6th committee? Oh, you're going to see a big contrast in what the January 6th select committee cherry picked uh, out of this surveillance video. Now, the surveillance video, um, it's important just for everyone to understand. This is what was captured by the Capitol Police's closed circuit TV security system on January 6th. And I believe they also have some of it from January 5th. So this this covers the entire uh, Capitol campus. And as you know, Liz, that's huge. So it will be a lot of buildings and outside areas that aren't relevant to the events of January 6th. But what they'll have is um, the security video from all different angles inside and outside the building. This video has been under protective orders, ordered by the Justice Department, signed off on by federal judges in D.C., Capitol Police claim that its security information shouldn't have been released. DOJ has designated it highly sensitive government material that is under even 30, 45 second clips, Liz, are under protective orders. Defendants and their defense lawyers have very strict rules as to how they can view or access this video. I mean, this is really egregious that this Trova video has not been made public made public before now. Um, because they are trying to cover up various aspects of January 6th. And you even saw on Tuesday, Benny, uh, excuse me, Monday, when this announcement was made, Benny Thompson, who is the chairman of the January 6th Select Committee, came out and condemned Kevin McCarthy for giving this video trove to Tucker Carlson. This shouldn't be a political fight. If this were a terror attack on the American people, which is what this DOJ, Biden, Joe Biden himself, The House Democrats, even some Republicans claim is a terror attack comparable to 9-11, then the American people should see all of it. If it were any other terror attack, so to speak, 
you would have had newspapers and journalists and legal defense funds and all sorts of entities screaming for the release of this video. Instead, it's been covered up. And so that's basically where it started. And that's why you're starting to see the left and people like Benny Thompson uh, condemn and reject the release of this video. That's not, Liz, because the video supports the narrative, right? It's because the video is going to be explosive. It will have both incriminating and exculpatory evidence for these January 6th defendants as we see this entire official narrative crumble under the weight of actual evidence. That's that's the part that gets me. I like I'm looking forward to the evidence that debunks what what we were hearing from the January 6th Select Committee, what we were hearing from the elected Democrats, what we were hearing from the mainstream media. But more than that, I don't understand the justification when the justification for indefinitely imprisoning these people who were charged on January 6th, but not allowing them access to exculpatory evidence. I mean, that's unconstitutional, is it not? It absolutely is. So much of this is unconstitutional, Liz. And you know this because you've covered my work and we've talked before. Uh, But the real villains here are the judges on the D.C. District Court. They are the ones who have enabled the total erosion of the constitutional due process First, fourth, sixth amendment rights of these defendants, a speedy trial, the presumption of innocence. I mean, you have men who aren't even accused of violent crime lists who have been in jail for two years awaiting trial on ridiculous concocted charges like obstruction of an official proceeding or seditious conspiracy. Um, I mean, this is really a travesty of justice, what's happening in D.C. And the concealment of the surveillance video is a big part of it. You have defendants who still don't see all of the surveillance evidence, uh, video or even body cam footage or anything related to their case. And their trials are already ongoing. Many of them have taken plea deals because they see what's happening in D.C. with these juries returning guilty verdicts in record time on every, practically every single defendant. So time is of the essence. And the January 6th committee has been complicit in violating the constitutional rights of these people. They don't care. Um, but look, I think it's the more that the public is becoming aware of what's happening to these people and how the Biden regime and Democrats and this court system has uh, has denied these people their rights. Um, I think we're going to continue to see public outrage. And maybe, Liz, maybe some of these judges will finally get the message. The American people are waking up to exactly what they're doing in that D.C. courthouse. It makes me sick to my stomach to think that we live in a country where due process of law has been entirely dis- discarded in favor of ideology. And this isn't hypothetical that American citizens are sitting in jail suffering for this. I, I'd like to go through a couple of the incidents that happened on January 6th that the mainstream media or the January 6th Select Committee, I suppose, they, they talk about the same things, they use the same narratives, but I'd like to go over some of the incidents and ask what you expect to see on the tapes that would perhaps contradict the narrative. So start with Ashley Babbitt. We were told that you know she was she was shot for accosting a police officer, that it was it was justified use of lethal force. What do you expect the video to show? Well, look, there's no security camera anywhere near what happened with Ashley Babbitt. Apparently, there is no security camera in the speaker's lobby, and this was right outside of that area where Ashley Babbitt was shot. What I do think we'll see surveillance video of is her body being carried through that area and out to first responders in the ambulance um, waiting outside. That's something that the American people really have not seen. There's been little snippets, I think, of open source video, but nothing official from the security system. So my guess is we won't see outside of what we've already seen from body cam footage or other people who are in the area recording it because there aren't any cameras there. But we will see how she was transported out of that building really uh, in sort of an inhumane way and then carried off by the ambulance. So I think that's all we'll see in terms of what happened with Ashley Babbitt. That seems weird that there's no cameras in the speaker's lounge. I agree. There's no uh, security cameras either uh, outside of the Columbus doors, which is the ceremonial entrance to the Capitol, which was the site of one of the breaches, including where the Oath Keepers entered. There's no security cameras there. And I've also been told there's no security cameras in the rotunda 
uh, which is very strange to me. But apparently that's what uh, the government has has told defense attorneys. That seems extremely odd, especially considering that the reason for the cameras are supposedly so that Capitol Police can keep the members of mm-hmm. Congress and their staff safe from not, not domestic threats, but from foreign threats, from hostile governments or terrorists who would wish to harm them. That seems odd that they wouldn't, they wouldn't surveil those areas since they're such highly trafficked areas. What about Officer Brian Sicknick? What do you expect to see on the camera regarding what happened to him on January 6th? Probably not much more than what we've already seen from body-worn camera footage, which is also has been very revelatory. And that is just now coming out because of these trials that are ongoing. The government's finally had to cough up this uh, body-worn camera footage from D.C. Metro Police. We might see more of his activity on the Upper West Terrace, where he went after he was sprayed. Now, he also suffered from the effects of police who were dousing people on the west side of the building with chemical spray. It also hit numerous police officers, and that's how that line uh, really broke down on the west side of the Capitol. And so it might show exactly from a little bit of surveillance video that we've seen that was given to the January 6th committee, Um, exactly what his movements were, where he went after he kind of washed his eyes out, uh, whether he did go inside of the building or he went back. We're not really sure exactly where he went, but I think that that's probably all we'll also see of him. I like Bank on Yourself, and I want to tell you about it because we have all been brainwashed into believing that the only way to grow our money for retirement is to risk it in the stock market. This is not true. You can reach your financial goals and dreams without taking any unnecessary risks. Do you really control your retirement money? If you've got a 401k or an IRA or a similar retirement plan, the government controls it, not you. They decide how much you can borrow or when you must pay it back, and you will owe taxes and penalties for taking money out too soon or waiting too long, even though it's your money. And thanks to our skyrocketing national debt and a Congress that continues to spend like a drunken sailor, Who knows how much you'll owe in taxes during a retirement that could last up to 30 years. Bank on yourself is a better way to grow and protect your hard-earned money. This retirement plan alternative has never had a losing year in 160 years. You are in control. You get access to your money for any purpose with no questions asked and without government penalties or restrictions on how much income you can take or when you can take it. Try doing that with a 401k or IRA. You can't. You can get a free report with all the details on how the Bank on Yourself strategy adds guarantees, predictability, and control to your financial plan. Just go to bankonyourself.com slash Liz. That's bankonyourself.com slash Liz. What about the first breach? That breach that Ray Epps has become quite well known for being associated with, at least tangentially, on some of these videos. What do you expect? Uh, because th- and this was pivotal, by the way. A lot of people know this, but just just a little backstory. This was pivotal because when a lot of the people who had attended President Trump's rally outside the White House marched to the Capitol, the barricades had already been moved. They didn't break through the barricades in the first area where where the quote unquote breach occurred. Those barricades had been moved, but we didn't see who exactly moved them or who gave the direction to have those barricades moved. That's such a good point, Liz, because Ray Epps was with that very first group uh, of people who breached the far exterior police lines. He actually whispered in the ear of Ryan Samsel, the man in the red MAGA hat, who kind of tossed over the first set of bike racks and knocked over a police officer and ran up those steps towards the west side of the building, Ray Epps was right there. Ray Epps and also the Proud Boys were there. And we know uh, informants who had been embedded in that group were also in that first official breach team, I guess you would call it breach group. Um, So we will be able to see all of Ray Epps's movements, not just what uh, people have caught on open, you know, their own videos that were recorded Also new video that I've seen again from the body-worn camera footage. But if we see all of the angles from that west side, we will see Ray Epps' movements. What we already know, Liz, from his testimony to the January 6th committee is that he was on restricted grounds for over an hour. Um, And so that's based on his own testimony. Right then and there, he allegedly committed a crime because that area had been shut off to the public. We have numerous defendants who've been charged with trespassing in a restricted area. Why hasn't Ray Epps? 
his explanation doesn't really add up. Um, and so we'll see exactly what he did, who he was communicating with, and the identity and activity of other known or suspected undercover agents and informants. Was he talking with them as well? So I think a lot of these pieces of the puzzle will will come together because, of course, the video will speak for itself. Mm. And the gallows, too, on the Capitol grounds. I mean, these were the this was the source of the quote unquote hang Mike Pence narrative that the left really uh, ran with. But we never saw who constructed those or who gave the direction to construct them or who encouraged and incited uh, that that whole melee around them. I'd be interested in seeing that. I definitely would too. And that's another uh, angle of the story that disappeared, not just by the January 6th committee, but in the media. I mean, this was a big thing. This is what the media said. The Trump supporters were going to go capture Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi and hang them on this mock gallows with this orange noose, by the way. But yet we still have no evidence of who built that. Whoever constructed that obviously also committed a crime. You're building something on public property that was restricted access or shut down to the public. There's no video of that. Uh, This is the most recorded event in U.S. history by far. The biggest criminal investigation in the Justice Department's history. But there's not a single photograph or piece of video that shows who put that up, what time they put it up, who was responsible for it. There's no more investigation into it. That, like the alleged pipe bomber, has completely disappeared uh, from the headlines and any investigation or interest by House Democrats. So um, I, I do think that that's one other aspect that we'll see. We will see who was up on the scaffolds. You know, there are people, not just defense attorneys, but witnesses who say there were people on uh, the scaffolding. Remember, that is where all the inauguration setup and staging was being erected. Um, There was a scaffold right in the middle. And people say there were people up on that scaffold with bullhorns, you could see on some of the video, directing the crowd what to do and kind of giving signals to other people in the crowd. We should very clearly see on surveillance video exactly when those people got there, perhaps identify who they were, exactly what their movements were, who they were communicating with in the crowd. Um, So that will be uh, another big piece of the puzzle. That west side of, of the building is really, I think, where most of the action is. And also, Liz, how so many people got into that lower west terrace tunnel where the violent confrontations between police and protesters took place. And of course, as we know, that's where Roseanne Boylan died. That's where she was asphyxiated by this really lethal, almost potent uh, chemical gas. That's where she was trampled on. And that's where she was beaten by a D.C. police officer. There was at least another woman who I reported on, Victoria White, who also was nearly beaten to death by two D.C. police officers in that tunnel. But it's unclear how so many people got packed into that tunnel. And so we will be able to see more angles than what we've, the limited uh, amount that we've seen from that terrace tunnel of exactly what happened, where Roseanne Boylan's body went, how first responders aided her, and the handling of her dead body being moved into the building by at least two of the celebrity January 6th police officers who this day have not detailed exactly what they did with her body. So we should be able to see that too. And I assume, although maybe this assumption shouldn't be an assumption, given that there's no cameras outside of the speaker's lounge, but I assume that there's cameras on the door so that we can see once and for all whether these doors were actually breached or whether police officers opened the doors for the people that were there. Right. So we do have some limited video that kind of shows one man, George Tenney, uh, who's also already been convicted, and he testified too, uh, of opening from the inside the Columbus doors. Um, There's a lot of dispute as to how that happened. You could see him talking to people on an upper level. Was that person telling him not to open the door? Was that person telling him how to open the door? It's just weird that a random protester would end up at the Columbus doors you know, these huge, I think they're 17 ton doors or something crazy and just open them and let all these people in. And we will see more surveillance video like we've already seen, which is police officers opening 
that Senate uh, door on the Upper West Side, opening those doors and standing there while at least 300 people entered the building. They're not trying to arrest them. They're not telling them that they're breaking the law, that the building is closed. You see, you know, sort of high fives. You see people speaking to the officers. There's there's no um, audio on the surveillance video. But obviously, it's a, it, it's a cordial environment there. Will we see more of that? Um, what we also should see is really alarming misconduct by police inside the building. You know, Liz, the narrative that the building inside was trashed by Trump supporters using, you know, bear spray and fire extinguishers, breaking things simply is not true. Um, the, the people who were responsible for any, most of the damage inside uh, were again DC Metro police officers and how they were treating people inside. Certainly, there were protesters who vandalized things, but the overwhelming majority of the uh, damage to the Capitol was by police. And and again, we're going to be able to see that some of the angles uh, from the surveillance video. So that's interesting because when we talked, I guess it was three, four, five months ago in September, and I asked you about the police contingent there, right? How was it that that the police contingent, so many police officers who rarely had days off were told to stay home, why wasn't it properly staffed if they foresaw this threat, which if they had these informants embedded in different groups mm -hmm. like the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys, they were supposedly aware of what was going to happen. You'd think that they would bulk up security. Instead, it was, it was reduced below mm -hmm. normal levels. And I ask you, who was responsible for this? Is there, is there one person who was... I suppose at that, not to use the word mastermind, but masterminded or orchestrated this entire this entire operation. And you said the word Pelosi to me. Is there going to be on these videos anything that shows us her role or the role of her staff or anything regarding um, her communications with with Mayor Bowser about the Capitol Police and the DC Metro Police? Such a good question. Unfortunately, Nancy Pelosi, as you know, her office was completely off limits to the January 6th Select Committee. We have seen no documents out of her office, no correspondence, nothing. Um, but what's interesting is that her House um, Sergeant at Arms, Paul Irving, did um, give over some material to House Republicans last year. He also testified to the January 6th committee. So did Nancy Pelosi's top security staffers. Shockingly, one of her security staffers, who also was shared with House Administration Committee, told the January 6th committee that planning for January 6th started in the summer of 2020. And when investigators asked this person, Jamie Fleet, well, why would you start in the summer of 2020 planning for January 6th? Uh, he said, oh, it's because, um, you know, we had seen Trump and how er erratically he acted. So we were just going to plan it in, in advance. What Paul Irving, though, testified to is that on January 5th, the day before, uh, he, he gave uh, only to Democrats, by the way, Democratic lawmakers, sort of a walkthrough of the joint session, which I'm not really sure why he would have to do that. Be interesting to see who was involved and how that went down. Even more alarmingly is Paul Irving said that he gave other Democratic lawmakers a tour or a, a redo of the evacuation route from the House. Now, Liz, if they weren't worried that anything was going to happen that day. If the same Paul Irving, who was denying Capitol Police, uh, Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sun's request for extra, extra help, extra National Guardsmen, if that same Paul Irving, who was denying extra security, at the same time gave a, a, a redo or a walkthrough of the evacuation plan, and 24 hours later, that's exactly what was happening, that's just one of those things that does not add up. So exactly what was happening on the 5th too in preparation for the next day. Uh, and it would be good to get some more answers from Paul Irving as to why at the same time he was worried about evacuating Congress, but leaving, it was his responsibility along with the Senate Sergeant at Arms to secure the Capitol grounds. That just makes no sense. I like Four Patriots, and I think you will too, because experts as recently as July were warning that a food shortage could be coming even here to the United States. Now, this is not something that we want to hear. We think about ourselves, our families, our loved ones, our children. Um, 
This is why survival food is more important than ever. I highly encourage you to create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots survival food kits. This is not ordinary food. This is good for 25 years, super survival food that I'm talking about. The kits of the food, they're compact, they're sturdy, they're water resistant, they stack easy for easy storage. They have different breakfasts, lunches, dinners. And by the way, you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. They're super easy. Anyone can do it. You just add boiling water, you simmer and you serve. And right now, if you go to fourpatriots.com and use my code Liz, then you can get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store. Just go to fourpatriots.com and use code Liz to get 10% off. That's fourpatriots.com code Liz to start building your own stockpile today. Fourpatriots.com code Liz. Did McCarthy, did Speaker McCarthy turn over video footage from January 5th? Um, that I've heard, I'm not, I do not have that confirmed, but I do know in the affidavit that was given by, uh, Capitol Police in March of 2021, they did say that they had, uh, also archived some of the January 5th video. Um, and I do know the January 6th committee used some of it because they tried to show representative Barry Louder Milk accuse him of giving a surveillance tour. Of course he didn't. It was just a walkthrough. I think he had his family because, you know, there was an inaugura- I, I believe they're swearing in the day before. Um, and so I believe that that, uh, video also is available. I'm not sure if that's part of what, um, Tucker's team has, but if if they don't or if it's still available and, and Kevin McCarthy has it, that should be a release too, because that could be as telling as anything we'll see from the January 6th videos. Well, I, I hope that it is included because we originally heard a report that there were 14,000 hours of videotape from January 6th. But uh, to my understanding, Tucker's team got a hold of 41,000 hours. So not exactly 14,000 hours, right. 41,000 hours uh, to comb through. That's a lot. And I doubt it's because there are additional cameras that we were not aware of. It's more likely that um, it's additional days or additional hours, not just those, what was it, eight or nine hours that they originally um, had put that protective order on. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully this is this is multiple days. So uh, l- let me zoom out and ask you big picture here. I mean, what what in your uh, mind or what what are you looking for as the real smoking gun, the one or two things that would obliterate not only the mainstream media's narrative, but the Department of Justice targeting of people who, maybe they did commit vandalism. That's wrong. Maybe they did trespass. That's also wrong. But they're not insurrectionists. They're not terrorists. And they're being uh, imprisoned indefinitely on that charge. Um, That's a good question. What the smoking gun would be. Um, I think the ID or the, and this is something that defense attorneys will have to do because they're going to have to corroborate what the video they see and what they see in discovery, especially under protective orders about the use of these informants, where they were, um, what they did. And so I think that will be, take some time, um, is matching up the identities of these informants or undercover agents with what defense attorneys know or have and what will come out in the trials. That will be part of putting it all um, together. But I do think, um, you know, how police and protesters, for the most part, uh, engaged each other um, also will will sort of, you know, debunk what the uh, what the regime and the media have tried to portray this as. And also, Liz, the whole idea that Donald Trump was responsible for this. Right. This is where uh, this Department of Justice and special counsel Jack Smith are headed. They want to um, get a criminal indictment against Donald Trump, which should be easy in Washington, D.C. grand jury, for either conspiracy, seditious conspiracy, obstruction of an official proceeding. Their game plan is that they will prove that he was responsible for what happened when the video will totally contradict that. They did not go there, to your point, a lot of people who arrived there, 2 o'clock, 2.15, The barriers had already been taken down. You will see the provocateurs who tore down this light, what they call snow fencing around the Capitol. You'll see people start to arrive. You'll see them totally peaceful, then being attacked by police officers. You'll see them being totally peaceful, being let into the building. You know, they were there ransacking the Capitol, infuriated after Donald Trump's speech, quite to the contrary, um, that that's just not what happened. So I think that that will be another 
uh, thing that will come out of this is that this was for the most part spontaneous, you know, protest demonstration, people wanting their voices heard, then being kind of drawn into this trap, attacked by police officers, let in at certain angles um, that had absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump's speech at the ellipse an hour or so earlier. That's the thing about this whole this whole convoluted event, right? Mm-hmm. Is that it is convoluted. And that the the best kind yes. of information warfare is so convoluted that people can't necessarily piece together what happened themselves. So they're forced to rely on some kind of quote unquote expert, in this case, the mainstream media and the January 6th committee are trying to appropriate that position as the expert. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it turns into something where a talking point like Donald Trump's mean language sparked an insurrection becomes what the general public believes, even though the truth or even though the reality and the proof shows otherwise. So my question now is, I guess, less journalistic and a little bit more analysis of of the voting population. If we find smoking guns on this tape, which we all expect to do because everything points to the fact that they exist, is it too late to change the public's mind about what happened on that event? Is this ingrained in their, in their, um, in their minds as the narrative that the Democrats has, have laid out or can it be reversed? I mean, look, this is going to be ingrained on the left in the Democratic Party. I mean, Liz, you still have the overwhelming majority of Democrats who think that Vladimir Putin interfered in the 2016 election and helped Donald Trump win the White House. I mean, these people are sheep. They'll believe whatever they're told by Joe Biden or Rachel Maddow or the Washington Post. Uh, But so those people are are not persuadable because they're illogical uh, uh, people. Um, But as far as the middle and certainly uh, on the right, Republicans, We can already see this big shift in public opinion on our side, and I think even independents. As the Twitter files have have shown, and as the evidence grows unrelated to January 6th, but this really um, egregious, unconstitutional collusion, the real collusion between the government and big tech uh, to show, to suppress the rights of American citizens, this will just be another angle to that. So people are really waking up to what we're up against. And this is this regime, the deep state, the ruling class, the administrative state, whatever you want to call it, working with private industry, powerful corporations, what are supposed to be free speech platforms to deny us our rights. Um, And this is, that's January 6th on steroids, because now we have political prisoners. Now we have egregious prison sentences for people who are convicted. We have a banana republic style environment in the nation's capital, both the legal and judicial system. So I don't think it would be as hard of a sell, Liz, to convince people that January 6th was mostly an inside job orchestrated by the very same interests who brought us Russia collusion, impeachment one, you know, impeachment two, uh, the Twitter files, the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop coverage, et cetera. Um, so I think it, I don't think it will be as heavy of a lift as it was, say, even a year ago. The climate, the environment, the outrage, the interest has really changed on our side. And so I do think that that's a ripe uh, environment for the truth now to be told about this, what I believe is the biggest scandal in U.S. history. Well, there's some element of hope in what you're saying, because if people's minds can be changed, then accountability can be meted out, even if it's not immediate. This stuff takes time, just like unraveling the Russia collusion conspiracy That's right. took time, but eventually it was done. And no, accountability wasn't hasn't been fully meted out for, for that either, but people understand that it was, that Vladimir Putin didn't didn't interfere in our election to the extent that he elected Donald Trump, right? He didn't cheat on behalf of Donald Trump. People understand that that the the Zelensky Ukraine impeachment was also a hoax. That this was a disgruntled a disgruntled member of the administration who politically disagreed with President Trump and tried to make it seem like a crime. And Democrats were happy to jump on that. This this is this is this is. I hate to use the word crazy because I don't want to, I don't need to put emotions. I don't need to tell people how to feel about this. They can hear the facts um, for themselves. But you reported on something about 10 days ago that I wanted, I wanted to, you to explain, but I also want to share this with everybody that's, that's in this conversation with us. Part of the trials that are still happening, that are ongoing, there's no reporting about them except from independent journalists like you, but the Proud Boys trial shows the extent that the government is, is acting 
with deceit, that they are acting in an unconstitutional manner, that they are not just hiding exculpatory evidence like these, these, um, these, these videos from outside the Capitol on January 6th, but they're actually fabricating documents and then planting those documents in a place that makes it seem like the people that are being accused of wrongdoing, the defendants are the ones who created that. Can you walk us through that? Because that's pretty unbelievable. Yeah, there's so much to this trial. And look, these Proud Boys are charged with con uh, seditious conspiracy. Only one of them is accused of a violence, and that's Dominic Pozzola, who smashed one of the windows on the east side. Otherwise, Ethan Nordine walked through an open door. He walked through the door where police were. Uh, Zachary Real did, is not accused of a violent crime, but these men have been in jail for two years. While the government not just delayed discovery evidence against them, especially related to now one defense attorney suggested 15 informants, Liz, embedded in the Proud Boys group months before January 6th. To your point, it looks like a document that they claimed proved that the Proud Boys had a plan to overthrow the Capitol on January 6th. Not only was not authored, by anyone in the Proud Boys organization or group. It was authored by someone, at least partially authored by someone who just as recently as 2018, uh, and this is a young guy, was a uh, government uh, in, was, was a government intelligence asset. He was in a special program, Florida State University, to, as he calls it, groom him to work in the FBI as some sort of intelligence or informant asset. But all of a sudden he creates this plan. His excuse is super flimsy. He passes it off to another woman who he knows. I don't know if she's a target. I don't know if she's also some sort of a source. They email this to Enrique Terrio, the uh, leader of the Proud Boys at the time. There's no evidence that he even opened it, Liz, let alone shared it with anyone as a plan for January 6th, but the government has used this as evidence against them. And this judge, Tim Kelly, who's an absolute disgrace to the bench, even though he knows the origination came from no one in the Proud Boys, he has still allowed it into evidence and let the prosecutor spin it to the jury as some kind of document that the Proud Boys or Enrique Terrio put together. Uh, at the same time, he won't, everything related to the informants is under seal. Even the media got outraged a few weeks ago when Judge Kelly had a sealed hearing about some information uh, related to a few key FBI informants. Uh, the DOJ has asked Judge Kelly to vet the defense attorney's questions, cross-examination questions of government witnesses, including FBI agents, about the use of informants. They want, this is crazy. Every lawyer who sees this is like, I've never seen this before. The government wants Judge Kelly to vet, pre-vet questions that defense attorneys want to ask witnesses. And Judge Kelly is going along with this. What's happening in this courtroom, it really, it makes me, what? it makes me sad what's happening to these men. Um, they don't deserve it at all. They were actually there to help protect police, to pro protect protesters from what had happened to them, Liz, in November and December of 2020, and that is being attacked by BLM and Antifa thugs in the streets of Washington, D.C., without any help from police. They were there to help the police. They were there to protect people. Enrique Terrio was talking with an undercover D.C. Metro agent who they were sharing information about what they were possibly hearing about potential violence. Joe Biggs was talking to the FBI in the summer of 2020, about BLM or Antifa violence. They were working with the police. And here they are now considered terrorists and traitors by this Justice Department with the full imprimatur of Judge Tim Kelly, who, by the way, is a Trump appointee, which makes it even more disgraceful. What's happening in these courtrooms it is truly tragic heartbreaking and infuriating. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, Liz, what I wrote about an American greatness in this Proud Boys trial. And this is, this is just a fraction of, what, of what's happening, partially because these videos have not been available to exonerate these defendants against the accusations and the targeting by the Department of Justice. Um, Julie Kelly, guys, you can find her work at American Greatness. You can also follow her on Twitter. She has one of the best Twitter accounts on the entire <laughs> on the entire platform. It's Julie underscore Kelly number two. Julie underscore Kelly number two. Highly recommend you follow her over there. Julie, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Liz. Appreciate being on. 
All right, guys. Make sure you subscribe to the show so that you don't miss anything. We will be breaking down all of these, everything, um, as the tapes come to light. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. You can follow us on YouTube, on Rumble, and on Locals. This is one of the most important stories in American political history. The ramifications of this story, the mainstream media narrative, the Democrats' targeting of American citizens, and what happened on January 6th, this will pave the way for what happens next in our country as a whole. The importance of this story simply cannot be overstated. And I'm glad that we're walking through this together. Uh, Again, make sure you subscribe because we will be breaking down each and every bit of footage as it comes to light. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.